This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. So this is going to be a little bit different podcast. And what I'm going to include here is the audio version of the first chapter of my book, The Complete Turtle Trader. I've recorded this as a part of a research project that I'm working on. And I'm not decided if I'm going to put this out as an audio book. Probably not, because I want to include it as part of a larger research project. So what's that? Well, Obviously, with my book being out for many years, The Complete Turtle Trader, the turtle rules, of course, are not a secret. They've not been for a long time. And the story is not a secret. The unvarnished true story is in my book, The Complete Turtle Trader. However, there are quite a few people out there that are always coming at me for more information. And as you might imagine for a subject, a topic like the turtle story, all of the lessons that went into it, all of the details that went into it, you can't put it, you can't put all the flavor, so to speak, in 80,000 words. I can be very complete in 80,000 words, but I can't include all the research projects. I can't include all the original audio. There's so many aspects you just can't put into a book. I can put everything from a complete perspective in there, but for those people that want kind of a a more total experience, it's hard to do. Hard to do. All the facts are there. The complete aspect is there. But, you know, you can't put, can't put audio in there. And I'm not talking about just my reading of my book. I don't read it, actually. I hired a guy who's got a pretty good voice. I didn't have the patience to sit down and read 80,000 words. And you will hear that in the excerpt that's coming up. But I'm talking about the audio of the players, something that I've had for a long while, the audio that really kind of gives you their perspective, their feel. What could this possibly do for anybody today? Confidence. Confidence. That's what this is all about. You take in all this information and you develop confidence. You learn by listening to other people, hearing their experiences, seeing what they went through, what's their perspective, their fears, their hopes, their desires, all laid out there. So this is what I'm working on, a complete turtle trading research project that I'll make available to everybody. But in the meantime, here is the first chapter of my book, The Complete Turtle Trader. Every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up. It knows it must run faster than the fastest lion, or it will be killed. Every morning, a lion wakes up. It knows it must run faster than the slowest gazelle, or it will starve to death. It doesn't matter whether you are a lion or a gazelle. When the sun comes up, you better start running. African Proverb Preface Trading was more teachable than I ever imagined. Even though I was the only one who thought it was teachable, it was teachable beyond my wildest imagination. Richard Dennis This is the story of how a group of ragtag students, many with no Wall Street experience, were trained to be millionaire traders. Think of Donald Trump's show The Apprentice, played out in the real world with real money and real hiring and firing. However, these apprentices were thrown into the fire and challenged to make money almost immediately with millions at stake. They weren't trying to sell ice cream on the streets of New York City. They were trading stocks, bonds, currencies, oil, and dozens of other markets to make millions. This story blows the roof off the conventional Wall Street success image so carefully crafted in popular culture, prestige, connections, and no place at the table for the little guy to beat the market, and beating the market is no small task. Legendary investor Benjamin Graham always said that analysts and fund managers as a whole could not beat the market 
because, in a significant sense, they were the market. On top of that, the academic community has argued for decades about efficient markets, once again implying there is no way to beat market averages. Yet, making big money, beating the market, is doable if you don't follow the herd, if you think outside the box. People do have a chance to win in the market game, but he or she needs the right rules and attitude to play by. And those right rules and attitude collide head-on with basic human nature. This real-life apprentice story would still be buried had I not randomly picked up the July 1994 issue of Financial World magazine, featuring the article, Wall Street's Top Players. On the cover was famed money manager George Soros playing chess. Soros had made $1.1 billion for the year. The article listed the top 100 paid players on Wall Street for 1993, where they lived, how much they made, and in general, how they made it. Soros was first. Julian Robertson was second at $500 million. Bruce Kovner was fifth at $200 million. Henry Kravis of KKR was 11th at $56 million. Famed traders Louis Bacon and Monroe Trout were on the list, too. The rankings and earnings provided a crystal-clear landscape of who was making master-of-the-universe money. Here were, without a doubt, the top players in the game. Unexpectedly, one of them just happened to be living and working outside Richmond, Virginia, two hours from my home. 25th on the list was R. Jerry Parker Jr. of Chesapeake Capital, and he had just made $35 million. Parker was not yet 40 years old. His brief biography described him as a former pupil of Richard Dennis, who? And noted that he was trained to be a turtle. What? Parker was described as a then 25-year-old accountant who had attended Dennis's school in 1983 to learn his trend-tracking system. The article also said he was a disciple of Martin Zweig. Who? Who just happened to be 33rd on the highest-paid list that year. At that moment, the name Dennis was neither more nor less important than Zweig. But the implication was that these two men had made Parker extremely rich. I studied that list intently, and Parker appeared to be the only one in the top hundred advertised as having been trained. For someone like myself, looking for ways to try and earn that kind of money, his biography was immediate inspiration, even if there were no real specifics. Here was a man who bragged that he was a product of the Virginia boondocks, loved country music, and preferred to keep as far away from Wall Street as possible. This was no typical money-making story, that much I knew. The common wisdom that the only way you could find success was by working in 80-story steel-and-glass towers in New York, London, Hong Kong, or Dubai was clearly dead wrong. Jerry Parker's office was absolutely in the middle of nowhere, 30 miles outside Richmond in Mannequin Sabbath, Virginia. Soon after reading the magazine, I drove down to see his office noting its lack of pretense, and sat in the parking lot thinking, you have got to be kidding me. This is where he makes all that money? Malcolm Gladwell famously said, there can be as much value in the blink of an eye as in months of rational analysis. Seeing Parker's country office was an electrical impulse for me, permanently dispelling the importance of location. But I knew nothing else at the time about Jerry Parker other than what was in that 1994 issue of Financial World. Were there more of these students? How did they become students? What were they taught? And who was this man, Dennis, who had taught Parker and others? Richard Dennis was an iconoclast, a wildcatting Chicago trader not affiliated with a major investment bank or Fortune 500 firm. As the locals were fond of saying on Chicago trading floors, Dennis bet his left nut. In 1983, by the time he was 37, he'd made hundreds of millions of dollars out of an initial grub stake of a few hundred. Dennis had done it on his own terms in less than 15 years, with no formal training or guidance from anyone. He took calculated risks, leveraging up huge amounts of money. If he liked to trade, he took all of it he could get. 
he lived the markets as a betting business. Dennis figured out how to profit in the real world from an understanding of behavioral finance decades before Nobel Prizes were handed out to professors preaching theory. His competitors could never get a handle on his consistent ability to exploit irrational market behavior throughout all types of markets. His understanding of probabilities and payoffs was freakish. Dennis simply marched to a different drum. He eschewed publicity about his net worth, even though the press speculated about it extensively. I find that kind of gauche, said Dennis. Perhaps he was reticent to focus on his wealth because what he really wanted to prove was that his earning skills were nothing special. He felt anyone could learn how to trade, if taught properly. His partner, William Eckhart, disagreed, and their debate resulted in an experiment with a group of would-be apprentice traders recruited during 1983 and 1984 for two trading classes. That turtle name? It was simply the nickname Dennis used for his students. He had been on a trip to Singapore and visited a turtle breeding farm. A huge vat of squirming turtles inspired him to say, We are going to grow traders, just like they grow turtles in Singapore. After Dennis and Eckhart taught novices like Jerry Parker how to make millions and the school closed, the experiment morphed into word-of-mouth legend over the years, supported by few hard facts. The National Enquirer version of the story was captured in 1989 by a Wall Street Journal headline, Can the skills of successful trading be learned, or are they innate, some sort of sixth sense a lucky few are born with? Since the 1980s are long past, many might wonder if the turtle's story still has relevance. It has more relevance than ever. The philosophy and rules Dennis taught his students, for example, are similar to the trading strategy employed by numerous billion-dollar-plus hedge funds. True, the typical stock tip chaser glued daily to CNBC has not heard this story. But the players on Wall Street, the ones who make the real money, no. The inside story has not been told to a wider audience until now, because Richard Dennis is not a household name today, and because so much has happened on Wall Street since 1983. After the experiment ended, the characters, both teachers and turtles, went their separate ways, and an important human experiment fell through the cracks, even though what took place is as significant today as then. The effort to get the real story out there started to gain momentum in 2004 when I was invited to visit Leg Mason's headquarters in Baltimore following the release of my first book, Trend Following. After lunch, I found myself in a classroom on the top floor with Bill Miller, the fund manager of the $18 billion Leg Mason Value Trust Fund, LMVTX. Beating the Standard & Poor's 500 stock index for 15 years straight put him in a similar league as Warren Buffett. Miller, like Dennis, had taken extraordinary calculated risks, and more often than not, been proven right. On this day, he was lecturing a room full of eager trainees. Out of the blue, Miller invited me to the lectern to address his class. The first questions, however, came straight from Miller and Michael Mobison, Leg Mason's chief investment strategist. They were... Tell us about Richard Dennis and the Turtles. At that moment, I realized that if these two Wall Street pros wanted to know more about Dennis, his experiment, and the Turtles, it was clear a much larger audience would want to hear the story. However, as someone not there in 1983, I knew the task of telling a complete story from an objective vantage with so many competing characters and competing agendas was going to be a serious challenge. Getting those who lived the experience to talk, coupled with sleuth-like research to corroborate everything, was the only way to make this story really come alive. That said, behind the scenes, the soap opera of those turtles who worked hard to prevent this book's publication is a saga in itself. Still, the biggest problem with a story like this is that most people don't want to actually understand how the real pros make big money. 
They want the road to riches to be effortless. Look at the collective public fascination with Jim Cramer, a man who is the polar opposite of Richard Dennis and Jerry Parker. Cramer is no doubt intelligent, but tuning into his extremely popular Mad Money TV show is like watching a traffic accident. There is a live studio audience that hoots and hollers at Kramer's fundamentally driven buy signals and wild prop-smashing antics. In one word, bullshit. That said, a lot of people, many highly educated, believe that Kramer's way is the way to get rich. Instead of employing a statistical thinking toward market decisions, the general public keeps investing based on impulsive feelings, letting an assortment of emotional biases rule their lives. In the end, to their detriment, people are always risk-adverse toward gains, but risk-seeking toward losses. They are stuck. The average newbie investor's method for success is not pretty. He gets in because his friends are doing it. Then the news media start up the stories of little guys doing well during a bull market. They all start to invest by picking stocks with low prices. As the market roars in their favor, thoughts of crashes never enter their mind. With all the money in there, it could never go down. They never see their own slaughter coming, even though their market bubble is never different from past ones. The media tell us that average investors now supposedly understand the concept of risk, yet worrying about possibilities while ignoring probabilities is at epidemic levels. People gamble away fortunes on money losing hunches or double down when logic says to fold. At the end of a lifetime, they are never any closer to learning how to do it right. But outside of the herd, there are the special few who have the uncanny knack for knowing when to buy and sell, combined with an uncanny knack to properly assess risk. Richard Dennis mastered that uncanny knack by his early 20s. Unlike the general public, wedded to their feelings to make decisions, Dennis used mathematical tools to calculate risk and used it to his advantage. What he learned and what he taught students never resembled Jim Cramer barking stock tips. More important, Dennis proved that his ability to make money in the markets was not luck. His students mostly novices, made millions for him and themselves. What was the real story? And how did the turtles learn their craft? What trading rules were they taught? And how can an average trader or investor use those insights today in his portfolio? What happened to them after the experiment in the ensuing years? Finding the answers to those questions, with and without Dennis and his students' cooperation, has kept me passionately curious since 1994. I am not alone in that curiosity. As author Steve Gabriel wrote on Yahoo Finance recently, the experiment has already been done that shows that we can all learn to trade for a living if we want to. That is why the turtles matter. The turtles are an answer to the age-old question of nature versus nurture the living proof of the single most famous Wall Street school for making money. Chapter 1. Nurture versus Nature Give me a dozen healthy infants and my own specific world to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee to take any one at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select. Doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant, chef, and yes, even beggar and thief. Regardless of his talents, pensions, tendencies, abilities, vocations, and race of his ancestors. John B. Watson early 20th century American psychologist. In the early 1980s, when Chicago's reigning trader king, Richard Dennis, decided to conduct his real-life social experiment, Wall Street was heating up. The stock market was at the start of a huge bull market. 
On the world stage, Iraq had invaded Iran. Lotus Development had released Lotus 123, and Microsoft had put their new word processing program, Word, on the market. President Reagan, much to the liberally minded Dennis's chagrin, declared it the year of the Bible. In order for Dennis to find his special breed of student guinea pigs, he circumvented conventional recruitment methods. His firm, C&D Commodities, budgeted $15,000 for classified ads in the Wall Street Journal, Barron's, and the International Herald Tribune, seeking trainees during late fall 1983 and 1984. Avid job seekers saw this. Richard J. Dennis of C&D Commodities is accepting applications for the position of Commodity Futures Trader to expand his established group of traders. Mr. Dennis and his associates will train a small group of applicants in his proprietary trading concepts. Successful candidates will then trade solely for Mr. Dennis. They will not be allowed to trade futures for themselves or others. Traders will be paid a percentage of their trading profits and will be allowed a small draw. Prior experience in trading will be considered, but is not necessary. Applicants should send a brief resume with one sentence giving their reasons for applying to C&D Commodities, 141 West Jackson, Suite 2313, Chicago, Illinois, 60604, Attention, Dale Delutri. Applications must be received by October 1, 1984. No telephone calls will be accepted. Lost in the back pages of national dailies, the ad attracted surprisingly few respondents when you consider what Dennis was offering. But then people don't usually expect the road to riches to be in plain sight. The ad invited anyone to join one of Chicago's most successful trading firms, making experience optional. It was as if the Washington Redskins had advertised open positions, regardless of age, weight, or football experience. Perhaps most stunning was that C&D Commodities was going to teach proprietary trading concepts. This was unheard of at the time, and still is today, since great money-making trading systems were always kept under lock and key. Dennis's recruitment process took place long before the chain reaction flow of Craigslist ads that attract in thousands of resumes within hours for any job. However, it was 1983 and reaching out to touch the world with a flick of a blog post was not yet reality. Potential students who were ultimately hired recall being stunned. This can't be what I think it is, was a common refrain. It was, unbelievably, an invitation to learn at the feet of Chicago's greatest living trader, and then use his money to trade, and take a piece of the profits. One of the greatest educational opportunities of the century garnered responses ranging from a sentence written on a coconut to the mundane, I think I can make money for you. Let's face it, guessing what would make a wealthy, reclusive, and eccentric trader take notice of you in order to get to the next step, a face-to-face -face interview, had no precedent. This casting of a wide net was all part of Dennis's plan to resolve his decade-long nature-versus-nurture debate with his partner, William Eckhart. Dennis believed that his ability to trade was not a natural gift. He looked at the markets as being like monopoly. He saw strategies, rules, odds, and numbers as objective and learnable. In Dennis's book, everything about the markets was teachable starting with his very first prerequisite, a proper view of money. He didn't think about money as merely a means to go buy stuff at the mall, the way most people do. He thought of money as a way to keep score. He could just as easily have used pebbles to keep count. His emotional attachment to dollars and cents appeared non-existent. Dennis would say, in effect, if I make $5,000, then I can bet more and potentially make $25,000. And if I make $25,000, I can bet that again to get to $250,000. Once there, I can bet even more and get to a million. He thought in terms of leverage. That was teachable in his book as well. On the other hand, William Eckhart, 
was solidly rooted in the nature camp. Either you're born with trading skills or you're not. Dennis explained the debate. My partner Bill has been a friend since high school. We have had philosophical disagreements about everything you could imagine. One of these arguments was whether the skills of a successful trader could be reduced to a set of rules. That was my point of view. Or whether there was something ineffable, mystical, subjective, or intuitive that made someone a good trader. This argument had been going on for a long time, and I guess I was getting a little frustrated with idle speculation. Finally, I said, here is a way we can definitely resolve this argument. Let's hire and train people and see what happens. He agreed. It was an intellectual experiment. Even though Eckhart did not believe traders could be nurtured, he had faith in the underdog. He knew plenty of multimillionaires who had started trading with inherited wealth and bombed. Eckhart saw them lose it all because they didn't feel the pain when they were losing. You're much better off going into the market on a shoestring, feeling that you can't afford to lose. I'd rather bet on somebody starting out with a few thousand dollars than on somebody who came in with millions. The ramifications of Dennis and Eckhart's intellectual experiment opened a Pandora's box of opinions and biases. Measuring and judging people by their IQ board scores, LSAT, GPA, degrees, or whatever other metric is the way most of society operates. Yet, if an IQ measure or test score was the only ticket needed for success, then all smart people would be loaded, which is obviously not the case. Stephen Jay Gould, the late great American paleontologist, evolutionary biologist, and historian of science, was always quick to askew society's misconceptions about intelligence. We like to think of America as a land with generally egalitarian traditions, a nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. However, Gould saw America slipping toward measures and ratios as a sole means of predicting life success and was appalled at the increasing predilection of Americans to use a hereditarian interpretation of IQ as a limiting tool. Dennis, like Gould, was not about to be taken in by a hereditary interpretation of IQ. His aim was to implant his mental software into the brains of his students and then place them into his controlled environment to see how they would react and perform. That someone of Dennis's stature and success would be so determined to prove nurture over nature that he would teach his proprietary trading methods to others was extraordinary. Certainly his partner was surprised that he was willing to put so much of his own money in the hands of amateurs. With a dark beard and sideburns and a receding hairline, William Eckhart bore an uncanny resemblance to Lenin and cut a sinewy, energetic figure, the polar opposite of the over-six-foot-tall, rotund Dennis. Of the two, he was the true mathematician, with a master's in mathematics from the University of Chicago and four years of doctoral research in mathematical logic. But for the purpose of their nature-versus-nurture debate, Eckhart was the unapologetic biological determinist, certain that his partner was a savant, an introverted genius with special genetic talents. Today, there are plenty of people who would still argue against Dennis, insisting that biological determinism, or the notion that genetics predicts the physical and behavioral nature of an organism, can't be overcome. That's bad news for a potentially successful trader or entrepreneur in any field who doesn't have the so-called pedigree or right IQ score. The irony is that even though Dennis's experiment proved otherwise over 20 years ago, success in the markets is still perceived by many as a virtual IQ caste system. Skeptics of Dennis's turtle experiment have long rolled out barrages of excuses about how serendipitous answering that little ad was. They argue it would have been impossible for anyone, except insiders, to have known that ad was the ticket to cracking Wall Street's top 100 paid traders, like Jerry Parker did. How could anyone know that an ad could potentially bypass what Warren Buffett has affectionately called the ovarian lottery, 
and give a random group of people the chance to make millions. It's hard to accept that fact. It's too much like a Hollywood script. It's a small world. Richard Dennis wanted a mishmash of personalities, similar to MTV's Real World, and their diverse casting calls. He selected both far-right-wing conservatives and bleeding-heart liberals. A high school graduate and an MBA were picked from the thousand-plus applicants who threw their hats into the ring. The wild cross-section of his final turtle picks demonstrated Dennis's diversity desires. There were college graduates from the State University of New York at Buffalo, business, Miami University in Ohio, economics, the New England Conservatory of Music, piano, music theory, Ferrum College in Virginia, accounting, Central Connecticut State University, marketing, Brown University, geology, the University of Chicago, Ph.D. in linguistics, McAllister College, history, and the United States Air Force Academy. Other Dennis students had recently held jobs at Cushman Wakefield, security guard, Caterpillar Tractor, salesperson, Collins Commodities, broker, the Ground Round Restaurant, assistant manager, A.G. Becker, phone clerk, Palomino Club, bartender, and Dungeons & Dragons, board game designer. One student simply declared his status as unemployed. Earlier job histories of those who made the final cut were even more mundane. Kitchen worker, teacher, prison counselor, messenger, accounting assistant, and waiter. Dennis selected one woman from the ad, a rarity in the 1980s all-boys world of Chicago trading. He also selected gay students, whether he knew their orientation at the time or not. His picks ran the gamut from mild-mannered professional academics to regular guy blue-collar types to some with wildly volatile personalities. There were certain things Dennis was looking for. He wanted students who showed a willingness to take calculated risks. Those who stood out from the herd in some kind of unconventional way had a leg up. This wasn't a normal hiring process in the early 1980s, nor would it be normal now. Today, MBA types, for example, are geared to the intellectual rigors of running a company, but are reluctant to get their hands dirty. They are the ones who think IQ and connections are all they need. They don't want to do the hard work. They don't want to really take a risk. Dennis didn't want those people. He was searching for people who enjoyed playing games of chance. He was looking for people who could think in terms of odds. Think like a Vegas handicapper? You were more likely to get an interview. None of this was surprising to those who knew Dennis. Reacting to opportunities that others never saw was how he marched through life. With a story like this, it's not hard to imagine the legend that has built up over the years. The experiment has inspired a cult-like reverence, often passed along by word of mouth. However, Charles Faulkner, a modeler of great traitors, was instantly struck by the deeper meaning of Dennis's experiment. He wondered how Dennis knew, saying, I would have sided with Bill's skepticism, even if it was teachable. It certainly should have taken more effort and a much longer time than Dennis allowed for learning it. The experiment, and more significantly, the results, violated all of my beliefs around effort and merit and reward. If something was that easy to learn, it shouldn't pay so well, and vice versa. I marveled at the range of thinking, awareness, and inference this implied. Dennis and Eckhart taught their students everything they needed in only two weeks to trade bonds, currencies, corn, oil, stocks, and all other markets. Their students did not learn to trade from a screaming mosh pit on the trading floor with wild hand signals, but rather in a quiet office with no televisions, computers, and only a few phones. Each student received $1 million to trade after his classroom instruction. They were to get 15% of the profits, while Dennis got 85%. No surprise that he would get the lion's share. It was, after all, his money. 
Dennis was honest about taking the majority of the profits when he said in November 1983, right before launching the experiment, that there would be no charity involved. He viewed the experiment as a way to diversify his portfolio. While he knew his no-experience-necessary students could be wiped out, he viewed it all as a way to gain more control of how his millions were being put to use, saying, I'm tired of investing in someone else's condominium in Timbuktu. Replacing condo investment ideas with a group of surrogates was a smart move. Many of his students went on to make 100% or more per year over four years. That's monster money-making. Even more important than those successes from the early 1980s is the current track record of three of the participants. Long after the experiment's ending, Eckhart, along with two of Dennis's former pupils, Jerry Parker and Paul Raybar, manage in excess of $3 billion in 2007. They still trade in a very similar fashion to how they did back in the day. Beyond Turtles-related successes, there are hundreds of others, Traders of big achievements who owe a debt of gratitude to Dennis for sharing his knowledge and experience. Additionally, men considered to be trading peers of Dennis, not trained by him, men of similar macro trading backgrounds, such as Bruce Kovner, Louis Bacon, and Paul Tudor Jones, are to this day regularly the highest paid on Wall Street. Of course, the $3 billion traded by Dennis's trading progeny doesn't seem that large when headlines today scream out with stories of new hedge funds launched with billions out of the gate. When John Wood, formerly of UBS, started his new fund with more than $5 billion, and when Jack R. Mayer, the former investment manager of Harvard University's assets, raised more than $6 billion for Convexity Capital, the $3 billion from Dennis's associates sounds less impressive. In fact, some argue that Dennis's lack of pedigree approach has been passed by. One recent story profiled a 27-year-old trader from Goldman Sachs, a well-bred product of Massachusetts's Tony Deerfield Academy and Duke University. He was described as having all of the ingredients of a grade A trader. One of his peers gushed. He's smart, competitive, and a hard worker. Keep your eye on this kid. That praise has to be put into perspective. If a trader starts a career with a prominent investment bank, he becomes valuable by using Goldman Sachs's money, offices, and connections. The access he has sitting in the catbird seat at a top bank is a major secret of his success. Investment banks were simply never the career paths of the great entrepreneurial traders. That is why Dennis brings hope. Independent-minded rebel traders like him never got to where they were by moving up bureaucratic ladders. They did not bide their time for 20 years engaging in office politics. Dennis and his peers were never part of a Fortune 500 hierarchy. They had one objective, to make absolute return money, trading the markets on their terms. It was high risk and high reward. Dennis's turtle experiment proved, all things being equal, that his students could learn to trade to make millions. However, all things being equal, after they learned the right trading rules to make those millions, if they did not exhibit, like Boston Red Sox slugger David Ortiz does in baseball, a walk-off home run mentality every day, they would fail. Great training alone was not enough to win for the long run. In the end, a persistent drive for winning, combined with a healthy dose of courage, would be mandatory for Dennis's students' long-term survival. Before getting into what really happened with the Turtles, who the winners and losers were and why, it's crucial to get acquainted with what made Dennis tick in the first place. Knowing how a regular guy from the south side of Chicago made a million dollars by the age of 25 in the early 1970s and $200 million by the age of 37 in the early 1980s is the first step toward understanding why nurture won out. I 
see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.